Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I think Jeff has just hit record. Um, so uh, again, if you're if you're tuning in and you miss anything towards the end, you've already missed an amazing conversation about closet renovation, cats, <laughs> dogs, so much in the last few minutes. But if you if you can't stay for the full time, it is being recorded. It will go up on the website. Um, Victoria Thompson, thank you so much for being here. I'm just going to make myself a little bit shorter uh, for our audience. If you're not already following her on Twitter, there it is. Uh, please make sure that you do. I'm going to throw uh, her website into the chat as well. There's so many great resources. You've done so many amazing presentations, uh, and it's nice that folks have access to that. I'm just going to mention uh, using the chat Zoom webinar. Unfortunately, the default is set. If you see the little blue box, it says only panelists. So you do want to make sure that that reads panelists and attendees. So that if you're uh, sending a question through or a comment or digital applause, uh, everybody can see that. So I've just changed mine. It's the blue box over from panelists. I clicked the little arrow and I selected panelists and attendees. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. So glad to have you here uh, with us. And uh, thank you all of all of you for joining us. Would love to know where you're from over in the chat. Uh, the chat is your place as attendees. If you can let us know where you're coming from tonight, it's always great to see where people are coming from around the world who are joining us. Um, and no, that's a place that's where uh, Trish and I will be over there taking your questions and fielding questions as well to to feed on um, to Victoria. So Victoria, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. And we're going to hand it over to you so we can learn from you. Yeah, absolutely. So before I do, I guess my dog's going to hang out. So this is Ren. He'll be here the whole time. Looks like he just kind of wants to hang out on my lap. So if he pops up, he tries to be discreet, but you can always tell because of his ears. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to go here. So you should see the slides and then I'm going to go ahead and press present that way we can all see the whole thing. So welcome again once more. My name is Victoria Thompson and I'm super excited to be here with y'all today. And this is going to be uh, just a you know, discussion and webinar on culturally responsive STEM education, uh, specifically the what, the why, and the how, right? So what is this? Why is this important? And then how can I actually implement this into my classrooms? Um, as they mentioned, you can follow me on Twitter at Victoria the Tech. I'm very active on Twitter where you can see my tweets about math and tech and STEM and bread and my dog and my wife. <laughs> and you are more than welcome, of course, to come along with me on that journey. But enough about that. We're gonna talk a little bit before we start about my background and why this is just important to me because I think that that's important for context. Um, so I'm a proud product of New Jersey K through 12 public education. Um, I was born in New Jersey and I was raised in Marlton, New Jersey. So I spent pretty much my whole K through 12, um, you know, experience there. But I uh, do not live there anymore. I am currently living in the Seattle area with my wife, Courtney, and my dog, Ren, who y'all just saw. I did my undergraduate degree in um, elementary education at the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina. And I have my master's degree in curriculum and instruction from Western Governors University. So my background is in primarily math education. I also have some science experience as well. But my current role is a STEM integration transformation coach, which I just refer to myself as a STEM coach, right? Because that's what I am. And what I do is I go into schools and I look for how to up-level STEM in schools, in programs, infusing STEM with humanities, right? And then also in, in classes that are more science, tech and math oriented, bringing that project-based learning and problem-based learning aspect to light in those different spaces. So it's a difficult role, but it's a fun role. Um, and then my research internally specifically focuses on culturally responsive math education, math pathways, um, and then also just using technology in classrooms. So taking a look at my background and thinking about the topic we're about to talk about, the reason why I'm very passionate about culturally responsive STEM education is because I'm a black woman that grew up in upper middle class New Jersey, then went to South Charleston, South Carolina, where there's a lot of racial tension, right? I have my master's degree and I'm a black math educator. There's a lot going on there. So when I first started looking and thinking about, you know, how to approach this type of conversation with people, it started with how do we make sure that our students are not feeling unintentionally left out 
and also making sure that as educators, we're intentionally making our instructional practices and using our resources to make sure that our students are being heard and that they're being valued. So that is why we get to culturally responsive STEM education. So let's talk a little bit about the what. So if I think about what is culturally responsive STEM education, I can essentially break it down to these six things, right? So STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. So when I think about what culturally responsive STEM is, it's that science, technology, engineering, and math curriculum and instruction. So curriculum is what we get from our schools, our districts, our sites, or whatever. And instruction is what we actually do with our kids. And it does these six things. First and foremost, it is going to what I call decolonize curriculum and instructional practices that are harmful to students of color, non-neurotypical students, and also students that don't fit what we refer to as the status quo. And to give you a little bit of insight to what that means, what that means is that we are specifically making STEM less white and less male. And if that seems a little bit odd to you, let me give you a bit of a scenario that you might want to try out and reflect on. I encourage you to go to Google Images or Bing Images or whatever platform that you're using, and I'd like for you to research scientist, or I'd like for you to research doctor. Nine times out of 10, it is going to be a white man that shows up. Of course, we know that female doctors exist. We also know that doctors of color exist, but algorithms play into that. And this is what our kids are seeing, right? When they are looking at these types of things. And I've worked with kids as young as kindergarten for science club, right? And I ask, what does a scientist look like? Draw it. And most of the time it's this Albert Einstein looking right guy with the crazy hair, but it's a white man. And even my students of color cannot empathize with that. And we want for our students to see that people look like them in this field. Another activity that I do with folks is if you actually Google chef, um, you know, for Google images or Bing images or what have you, the Swedish chef from Muppets actually comes up first, you know, before a chef of color or before a female chef. And for me, that's problematic because I used to run a STEM cooking class, which I'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, but, you know, we're looking for these things intentionally in our practices. Our kids are going home or maybe they're even in our classrooms, they're doing research and they're not even seeing things or people that look like them. So we have to be very careful about that in our practice and also in our work, right? Also, we're remembering that this is going to be directly addressing and dismantling what we refer to as white supremacy culture and individualist thought. This directly relates to what I talked about previously. And I'm not calling you a white supremacist. If you're listening, that's not the goal here. What I'm talking about with white supremacy is when our kids are Googling or when they're researching or even when they're learning, which we'll talk about in a few moments, but they see white men, right? The white men are the dominant folks in STEM and for our young women and for our students of color, that's problematic because they do not see themselves. So we have to address this as a culture and we also have to dismantle it and bring to light women and people of color in STEM education. How we can also do this specifically with instructional practices is that we're empowering students with hands-on instruction. We're also leveraging inquiry-based learning. And we're also really laying heavy on those project design opportunities. So not just a math test or a science research paper, we're making this collaborative because that's what STEMinists do, right? STEMinists in their actual lives. They're collaborating with other folks. And it's not just research paper after research paper, they're actively working with others to make our world better. So the least we can do as educators is make sure that that happens with our kids. They provide realistic insight and opportunity for students to pursue STEM in K through 12 education and beyond. One of my biggest pet peeves as a coach and then also when I was a classroom teacher is that, you know, we have a subset of kids that maybe think that being a meteorologist is just going on TV or maybe a subset of kids that think that, you know, being a mathematician is looking at statistics all day. We as adults know that that's not necessarily the reality, but for kids, they might not know. 
So we're highlighting the fun, but we're also highlighting the reality at the same time. Uh, that is very uh, pertinent for me in a lot of the work that I do, right? So if we're thinking about trying to make the world better and also looking to make sure that our students understand what's going on, we have to be real. And sometimes real ain't pretty, right? Sometimes real is not pretty, but we have to be honest with our kids. And then for our last two, we encourage students to become critical thinkers in this process. This again is just kind of by nature of what we do. And then we also foster what we call soft skills authentically, right? So soft skills, meaning the collaboration, right? The critical thinking, all of these things that employers look for that we want to foster in our classrooms together. So this is the what, right? What is culturally responsive STEM education? Specifically, this is what it looks like. Now, I'm gonna give it a click. We're gonna talk specifically about how this relates to STEM at large. Because as I mentioned, I'm a big believer in making sure that things are real for our students and also making sure that they understand the landscape and the reality of what's in front of them. And even though I was, of course, a former classroom teacher, some of y'all listening might know that I also consult for big, big tech, right? I live in Seattle, so I work with some major players here in the Seattle area. Um, and then I was also a full-time tech consultant for some time before I decided to transition back into classrooms and schools. So I have a bit of experience in a lot of different areas. And uh, unfortunately, what I have to report is that uh, the landscape does continue to look a little grim, specifically for women and for our students of color. So I would personally feel a bit remiss if I didn't talk about this right now, uh, which is why I'm going to go ahead and start. So this is from Cell, uh, Cell Press. I don't know if any of y'all follow them or subscribe to them, uh, but they're basically like a science editorial. And they released, again, an editorial that stated that science has a racism problem. They specifically called it out. If you take a look, just scanning the article, they stated they are the editors of a scientist journal, right, or a science journal. There are 13 of them. None of them are Black. So they're specifically talking about underrepresentation of Black scientists in the field, right? Why does their work not be or like words why is their work not being amplified right why does their work not come to light in some of these things and again this is not a catch-all but what they're saying is they are specifically highlighting a need or highlighting something that they view is wrong here they're also acknowledging if you look off to the uh, second column right that they are part of the problem because they are not pressing for it on a daily basis they are saying that there needs to be more representation because they're acknowledging that the folks that read cell press are not just white, they're not just male, right? They're not just biologists, they're not just chemists, they're scientists and science educators that come from all areas of the world and also of education. So they are specifically calling it out right here in this moment. And also what they're doing is they're saying, we have to fix this. And this is also something that I have encountered with my students that are going into science fields. They acknowledge and recognize that sometimes they might be the only person of color in the room, right? Now, what we can do as educators, of course, we're not part of cell press, that's not us, but what we can do is make our experiences inclusive and responsive for our students in our classrooms, right? We can't control the publication, but we can control what goes on in our room. All right, let's talk a little bit about big tech, right? I'm a big tech consultant. I can totally talk about this. This is CEO of Microsoft. She, uh, so Microsoft recently released an initiative that they are going to be increasing their black leadership, right? Tw twofold from now to 2025, okay? And I remember when I first saw this, my first reaction was, why is it gonna take until 2025, right? I kind of scratched my head a little bit. If we take a look at these initiatives, right? Increasing representation, engaging ecosystem, strengthening communities. These are all good in earnest. But what I see when I enter spaces as a tech consultant is sometimes I'm not only the only woman, but I'm the only woman of color. And a lot of the students that I taught previously back when I was in South Carolina, they're entering these spaces and they don't find it welcoming because not only do they not see anybody that looks like them, 
But when they're in a situation or a workplace, it sometimes becomes hostile. And I've also personally experienced this. I was working with a subject matter expert in, in big tech that not only tried to block my pay because she was not happy with my presence being a black woman at the institution, but on top of that, she completely tried to derail my work. These are the unfortunate realities of STEM. I was not prepped for this when I was in K-12. I was not prepped for people not knowing who I was and not understanding who I was. And I see so much black and brown you know, youth leadership being pushed out of things like this. They show so much promise in K-12, but then the institutions are not suited for them. And again, although we cannot change the institutions as educators, right, we might not have a direct influence. What we can do internally in our classrooms is say, you don't have to put up with this. You can find a company or you can find an institution or you can find a school that values you who you are, right? Because no amount of money is worth your soul. Last but not least, before we go into more of like the how, right? We're gonna talk a little bit about just math education and STEM education as a whole. So this specifically is about race and math education, but I think that this could be parlayed into other areas as well. So this is more of a discussion on just the myth of the achievement gap, right? So if we talk about black, Latino, indigenous youth, right? They've got different accesses and by different, I mean disparate, you know, to honors, gifted, AP, IB math courses, that's problematic. But what's happening is that folks are reporting this as an achievement gap when really it's an opportunity and access gap, right? So what's happening when this all goes on is that this kind of perpetuates different things in schools. What does it say of a school that might be majority students of color, but doesn't have an honors math program or an honors science program? I wouldn't knock the students. I would question the school, right? That's where my questioning would begin. But instead what happens is we question the students and we make assumptions. So for all of these misconceptions and things that are going on in all three examples that I gave, there's very obviously a problem and an issue. And this is something that we as educators have a unique opportunity to take a look at. And again, we might not be able to change the professional landscape, but what we can do is look at our students and say, you don't have to put up with this. You are loved, you are valued, you are important, you matter, right? Your knowledge matters. And you can look for an institution that values these culturally responsive principles. Because the three things that I just told y'all, those are not culturally responsive. Those are rooted in history, racist history, misogynist history, right? There's a lot going on there and a lot to unpack. And what we can do for our students is unpack that personally, uh, but we can also make our curriculum accessible. That way students can find institutions and sites and workplaces that work for them. And even if you work with like, you know, early childhood or maybe elementary, that's totally fine, right? We're laying down the seeds and the foundations in order to ensure that our students are understanding, uh, you know, of course the curriculum, but also looking to kind of figure out where they wanna be later on in life. So if I think about the how, right? How can we make STEM culturally responsive and accessible for our students? Four things I think are actionable, especially whether you're virtual, face-to-face, -face. like right now I'm in Seattle area, we're 100% virtual, uh, but they can be done anywhere. So the first thing is that academic success and cultural relevance need to work together. So these are not two things that are going to operate in a vacuum. When you do the cultural, you need to talk about the academic at the same time. And I'm gonna show y'all an example that I did with students in the past. Second, we're, what we're going to do, and this is probably the easiest thing that you could do if you're just kind of starting from zero and you need you know, some assistance or maybe you're wondering what to do, try diving deep into STEM discoveries, right? Things like STEM findings, things like achievements in what we like to refer to as non-Eurocentric cultures. So if you're working with students on a project and instead of focusing on a building in the United States, in Paris, in London, in Rome, you know, maybe you pick a building from Indonesia, right? Maybe you pick a building from China. 
And of course, that's a very basic example. But if we're thinking about achievements in non-Eurocentric cultures, math did not start in the United States. And it certainly didn't start with a lot of the European countries that folks think it did, right? It started in black and indigenous countries and populations. Really dive deep into those cultures and you might be surprised what you learn, but the kids love it and they're always very excited to hear about it. Another thing that you can do is do something that I call integrate what I call collectivist thought. So collectivist is very interesting in STEM because usually in STEM, I mean, we can follow the thought process. Here's the formula or the idea. Practice the formula or idea. If you're lucky, you might get to work with a group on a lab or a project or something. Idea gets presented, next topic. It is very individualist to a degree. When I say integrate collectivist thought, that means that you are collaborating with your classmates and your teammates. You are inviting discussion. You are having conversations about your topics. And these are things that are not necessarily uh, usually reserved for STEM. You know, sometimes they really are reserved for like ELA social studies, but I think that it just makes the class a whole lot stronger because you have the opportunity to use this as a platform for discussion about culture in science and math. And again, we don't really see these conversations happen at all, but the more that we have them, the more that our students understand that these things are, you know, integrated and also woven together. And then our last is giving choice for student choice and agency. So we're giving that choice and we're also giving those opportunities, right? So what that means, and I completely just kind of get frustrated with this sometimes because I feel like sometimes in STEM, we do not get a choice. I was just at Lego with my wife the other day. So we were at Lego in Bellevue, Washington, and it's very clear which sets were labeled for girls and which sets were labeled for boys. To me, that's not choice, that's not agency. That is a company, and, and I love Lego, but that is a company trying to kind of say that this is for this subset of folks and this is for the other subset of folks. Not choice, not agency. That's a very concrete example. But if we think about this when it, you know, with regard to STEM and the choices that we make in our classroom, I feel like sometimes instructional practices and maybe activities are labeled more girl-centric versus boy-centric. Not only do I dislike that term, right, those terms specifically because they're very binary focused, but I don't like that certain traits and qualities can be attributed to certain genders, right? I think that boys can be collaborative. I think that girls can be strong. I think that everybody can be collaborative and strong, right, regardless of how you identify. So if we stop putting kids into these buckets and we just give them opportunities to speak up and we have collaborative opportunities and also discussions, you know, for students to have that, then we just make the landscape better for everybody. So I know that was kind of like a very broad four point view, but before we dive in deeper, I really want to open it up to discussions, questions, comments. Um, I feel like it's getting very dark in my office, so I might have to turn on my big light. But I'm going to stop sharing because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to check it out. So I'll stop. And then if anybody has any overarching questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer before we go into the nitty gritty. We were, we were actually just having a short exchange, your point about, again, how STEM or, you know, your Lego example sometimes positions like this will be the girl version of STEM. Uh, Joy pointed out in the chat that a colleague was looking to buy a STEM kit for her daughter and that the flower kits were labeled for girls. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, and it, the it's true. Were pink, so much of the market. Like, right, like pink, purple, yellow, right? Like all of those various shades. They they love to do that for very infuriating reasons. But <laughs> yeah. so I really appreciate you pointing that out because um, it, you know, I, I think our our language and our framing as educators does have lasting impacts. You know, um, I, I really sometimes, you know, the the bee that gets in my bonnet is I'll often hear folks sort of say like, oh, you know, the the mean girl dynamic, and I feel like, you know, like 
everybody argues with everybody sometimes like that's part of childhood a little bit is kind of going through arguments with friends and uh you know that's that's a reason that social emotional learning is now such a big focus is i think that's kind of a universal experience but when we frame it as you know that's a girl's issue Mm -hmm. um and i wonder how many i'm just wondering you know this idea of of adopting a curriculum and how, how many school districts are looking at it through a lens of, you know, when we're adopting and I hate the idea of STEM kits, don't give me started on STEM kits that you think you can just go out and purchase and, and plop right. in. But I know a lot of school districts do that. I wonder if they're looking at them through a lens of, you know, if there is a STEM curriculum, that is the flower kit is labeled for girls are our districts looking at the way we adopt all curriculum through a lens of, you know, what are the biases that are, that are inherent in the curriculum that we adopt that are coming from companies, much like you're saying, Victoria, like I love Legos, but there is this inherent, like it exact, you know, it's only for this age and for boys and girls, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, Yeah. I just, you know, there's just how, at what level are we, are we really putting this curriculum underneath a lens, you know? Yeah. And I think that for us as consumers, that's a really powerful moment. Like if you feel empowered to do it, to speak up to whoever, right? Whether it's the company directly, whether it's to a PR person, I'm like looking at the chat and I feel like a comment just came through that. I'm like, yes, I totally agree, right? Like use that as a moment to speak up to consumers, um, you know, other consumers, and then also use that as an opportunity to speak out to companies because I mean, I've had quite a few moments with companies where I'm like, this is not inclusive. You know, if you separate even just binary into boy, girl, we're already losing quite a few folks. Mm -hmm. And then if you're also doing this weird gendered nonsense with like the pink and the purple and then the blue and the green, like you've already lost me. STEM is inclusive and STEM is for everyone. And I feel like that again, goes back to our principles as educators, where we want for our topics to be for everybody right? We want for our content to be for everybody, but then our students are going out into a world where it is very binary for them. And, they, and they're and they constantly receiving messages that something might not be for them. And again, that's not what we can control internally. What we can do is, again, make our classrooms spaces where we can look at kids and say, you do not have to put up with this, right? You can find a place that values you because you are loved, you are valued, you matter, your wisdom matters, and this is a place where you can be. But then we can also look at companies and say, what the heck is going on, right? Like, why are, like, why are your Lego sets, like, Lego Friends is all girl focused, right? It's in the girl section. I've never bought a Lego Friends. Did I buy a Disney castle? Yes, but <laughs> that's a different story, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, yeah, that's such a, I, I love that Joey pointed that out in the chat, like what a great, you know, writing project, student voice, get in touch with that company, you know, the power of social media. I love, I love that idea. I think that's so powerful. And then noticing, you know, some of the brands who are kind of getting it right, you know, like I love following Ben and Jerry's on social media. Yes. I just feel like, the best. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, sometimes ask school leaders, you know, it does, is your school learning more about the reality of the world through your school or from a company like Ben and Jerry's? Like yeah. which one's more progressive, an ice cream company or school? Mm. Um, and then also, you know, I think it's really important to circle back to the fact that we have a locus of control in our classrooms that is very unique that the kids don't necessarily get outside of that. So one of the questions that I continuously circle back to is just how do we give this information to students And how do we do it in a way that's developmentally appropriate? Because what I might say to a 12th grade student who's about to enter college or career or whatever, right? They're about to enter the real world, right? I mean, I don't like that phrase because I think we're all living in the real world, but you know, they're like, they might leave home. They might be going to a different state. They may be going to a different country, whatever it is, they're not going to be here anymore versus a kindergartner or a first grader, what I would say to those two groups, they're very different, right? So culturally responsive, that frameworks is still a thing, but it's going to look different based off of the population of people that I'm speaking to at the time. And your work, like you mentioned the Microsoft and they said that it'll take them until 2025. Is part of that part of the education? I mean, what, what percentage of you know, I'm just thinking in the STEM field of computer science are, you know, African-American, Black, 
female is part of the reason why it's going to take them five or six years is because they have to first identify that's a problem or are the people there just not getting hired? That's what I don't know. That is a wonderful conversation. That could probably be an entirely different webinar. Um, so for full disclosure, so I've consulted for Microsoft in the past, right? I've got a couple of projects I'm working with them on now. Um, I've, with my current team, all sunshine and rainbows. They're all lovely. I've never felt slighted. The prior team, and eh, I was the only woman of color that was on the team. Everybody else was either a white man or a white woman. And when I think about my times going up to corporate office or maybe having virtual meetings with folks, there's nobody of color there. And I ask a lot of questions as to just why. Mm. Um, and I really don't know. I mean, if mm. folks are interested in doing more research, I mean, there's research upon research about just like the good old boy system and how that works in tech, right? It's like white tech bros, like, sorry to use that term, but I'm gonna use it, right? Like white tech bros, get hired and they hire more white tech bros and it just kind of becomes a boys club there. And there's not a lot of women and there's certainly not a lot of people of color. I was just part of a Seattle black leadership uh, community panel, you know, not too long ago, you know, with folks that were from big tech in Seattle and there were only like 20 of us, <laughs> like literally there were only 20 and we were comprised of a couple of different organizations. So to say that there were 20 across the span is a lot and just yeah. speaking me personally like i work for a black tech company like founded by a black woman um every like everybody on my executive team is a black woman which is almost unheard of uh you know my entire organization is almost all people of color which is also almost unheard of right so i know that it can be done sure. so i say this because i know that this can be done because i work for a place like this yeah. So I wonder why it's not like this in other spaces. Hmm. I have an inkling, yeah. but nobody likes to hear what, what, what <laughs> is. <laughs> right, because it's rooted in patriarchy, right? It's rooted in good old boy system. It's rooted in fear, you know, of having, you know, the other there. Um, and, and that was definitely what I experienced my first time being a member there, which was unfortunate, but I am glad that I'm beginning to work on projects more. Uh, with folks, and, and and this is recent, maybe like a week and a half, two weeks ago, right, where they're like, hey, start working on this. Uh, but I am really glad that the teams I'm working on value my leadership and value my voice, mm -hmm. instead of just kind of using me as, oh, she's over here. And that's how I felt the last time that I was there. Hmm. Yeah. Rant over. <laughs> No, oh, thank you for for sharing those. You know, those lived experiences are really powerful, and I'm I'm wondering actually if you get the opportunity to to share those specifically with your students because, yeah. you know, again, research is great, but I think sometimes students, when we can Very share people. our personal yeah. stories, like that has a different amount of gravity. Yeah, I do all the time, and I'm not shy, um, and I also do not take offense, right? If someone is like, oh, well, you talked about this company or, oh, well, you talked about this and, okay, well, if you didn't want me to talk about it, then it shouldn't have happened, right? <laughs> like, like I'm on podcasts all the time. I work with other companies all the time and very intentionally, whenever I vet projects or whenever I vet working with people, I look to make sure that I'm not going to, I mean, like censorship to like a certain degree, right? Like you're not expecting me to cuss or you, you know, you're not expecting me to like take off my clothes or whatever. But what I am saying is it's expected that people are being candid and honest. And I think that that's very important. And when I work with students and when I work with companies, it's that element of I don't want for people to think that I'm saying something incorrectly or maybe I'm being very vague about it. Because when I think about my experience growing up as a black woman, I would have loved to know specifically what companies were not treating people properly. Mm. And I would have loved to know, like even if I was in a division of a company, what team was not treating somebody properly, right? Mm. So I always enter this from the space of, I would have loved to know that. And the feedback I get from my students is, oh, well, I was working with so-and-so, but I had to leave because they said something sexist to me. Or, well, I had to leave, you know, this place uh, because, you know, they were saying racist comments in the break room. Or even something, you know, like, oh, well, I wasn't promoted, but this guy was, and he makes more than me, even though I have my doctorate and he just has his bachelor's, right? Or like he just has his associates. So just things that they wish they would have known, right? Mm. 
And I operate from the standpoint of, well, I wish I would have known that, right? And my students wish they should have known that. So I am always very candid about what happened. Mm -hmm. But because of the candidness, you know, whatever you want to call it, right? Like I have gotten contacts and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you, right? Like, what can we do to make it better? So I'm very thankful that it's not a dead end conversation, at least with me. I hope that that continues with everybody else that folks come in contact with. Because if somebody leaves because they feel as though they weren't included or because the environment wasn't culturally responsive, then I feel like the institution or the site or the organization or whatever, you know, has a duty to literally look at the internal practices because it's not on us as people of color or marginalized people to fix the problem, right? We just showed up, we're here to work. <laughs> you know, it's your job as a institution or organization or whatever to fix what's going on, right? We can help, but we're not a monolith and we're not there to solve all the problems. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that, you know, a hundred percent, absolutely, and I think the same applies to schools and schools also addressing where. Absolutely, yeah. You know, just going back to what you were saying earlier about who is it that you are saying is, you know, worth studying or worth noting in the field of STEM, and I'm, you know, just thinking back to different schools I've worked at, and, you know, just kind of doing a mental audit of if you asked students just the question of, okay, you know, name ten geniuses what would we notice in, you know, the theme of, of folks right. who, you know, yeah. or just mentally imagine a genius. What's the thing that comes to your mind? Yep. Even working with kids too. And, and we're going to go into this like one side, cause I have like a project I did with my students on gender and racial bias in mathematics, um, you know, that I'm going to share today. But before we did that uh, together, we did like a hidden figures project where I gave them a list of known scientists and mathematicians. And, you know, it's mostly like white men, white women, right? You have like your, like Einstein's and your Pythagoras, right? You've got like your Marie Curie's. And I would ask them, I said, okay, well, do you know anybody on this list? And they said, of course we know all of them. And I said, okay, well, you know, for the purpose of this project, you're going to research a, a STEMinist and it cannot be anybody on this list have fun right and they <laughs> they freaked out i'm sure the backlash i received on this project <laughs> like the most parent calls i think i've ever gotten in my entire life because literally the kids and the parents families you know whoever was involved they were shaking in their boots they had no idea what they were going to do and i feel like this is so very much ingrained in our world in K-12, because we only hear about certain people. Like That's I think so about the, like I learned about George Washington Carver when I was in elementary school, right? Like black man pioneered peanuts. I love peanut butter. I love Reese's. I love him. He's great, right? <laughs> so George Washington Carver. I also learned about Marie Curie and I learned about Florence Nightingale. Those are the only three that I think I can in, in full confidence say that I learned about in school. And that's really problematic when you look at the grand scheme of things, because there are mathematicians of color, there are scientists of color, you know, there are other women that exist, there are non-binary people that exist, right? And they're just never highlighted or talked about, ever, ever. These same people get talked about. And then our students have a very convoluted view, then when they graduate, of what a person looks like in these fields. Yeah. And that's problematic, yeah. I think the same thing, you know, from a, a social studies ELA lens, like from a social studies lens, and I don't remember, I don't know if this is still true, if somebody can correct me in the chat, but I remember they did an audit and it's something like students learn American history from basically Christopher Columbus through World War II for all 12 years. And yeah. it's very rarely do you get anything that is like the Vietnam War or the 80s or anything that happened after World War II is just kind of like, you know, you learn about the Great Depression three times. Right. You learn, you I study remember, the 13 colonies forever, but you I don't do the entire history. In, like the Nina, the Pinta and the Santa Maria when I was in <laughs> kindergarten or preschool. But I also grew up in New Jersey. So we also did like a Jewish Seder plate. And, and I remember that. And I was like, I like love that. But yeah. yeah, it's just interesting, you know, because it also varies state to state. You know, when I was in New yeah. Jersey, like we never had school for Yom Kippur, right? We also never had school for Rosh Hashanah. 
like I, I had a ton of Jewish friends, right? We all celebrated all of our holidays together. I never felt like Christianity and Judaism were pitted against each other. You know, when I was growing up in New Jersey, they almost walked along like side by side. Then when I go to South Carolina, it's very, you know, like Christian, right? Like Baptist. So we didn't have school off for like Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah. And I remember teaching and, and literally asking somebody, you know, like, hey, it's Yom Kippur. Why don't we have off? And they were like, what is like, Victoria, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? Like, what is Yom Kippur? So, so even like little differences like that were really frustrating yeah, for me. State. Because yeah. like, again, to me, that's not culturally responsive. I know that South Carolina has people that don't just celebrate Christmas, but they very clearly favored, right, at the time, one specific set of folks and also, you know, their um, holidays and whatnot. And I mean, I didn't, you know, first year teacher, I didn't have any of the power to change any of that, but it really did kind of put into perspective for me how it does change state to state. And now that I'm in Washington too, it's like I'm on the board that is putting black studies and African-American studies into K through 12 schooling. It's like I applied for the job, I got it, like, yay, I love it. But it has been a bit of a process, right? Because what works for Seattle Right. right, like, right, might not work exactly for the eastern the side of Washington. Yeah. And I'm not saying it might not work in the sense that, like, the principles don't align, but just that, you know, schools are different, schools look different, right? Demographics are different. So we're trying to figure out, okay, so if Seattle Public Schools has a majority of teachers that are white, right? But like this little tiny district in Eastern Washington that's rural has like one schoolhouse and three teachers, right? So, <laughs> right, so how do we make it accessible for like the 5,000 plus teachers in Seattle public and these three teachers in this district? It's hard, it's hard, but that's a, what, you know, culturally responsive is also all about. You know, we have to make it accessible for everybody because that's how we get people that are interested in this kind of work and this kind of stuff. Yeah, and, you know, to your point, I think, you know, you're right, schools, demographics are different, but I bet if you looked at like the vision or mission statement of all those schools, they'd have very similar language in terms right. of- Buzzwords, right? Yes. Like, right, empower, right. Um, uh, uplift. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, just certain things that you see whenever you look at those. Absolutely. So it is just that sometimes I think, okay, you know, are, do, are you serious about your values and mission when you're tested, when it's going to make you a little bit uncomfortable or, right. yeah. or not? Yeah. And I call that put your money where your mouth is, right? Yeah. You can talk a big game about responsiveness. You can talk a big game about equity. You can talk a big game about making sure that you're inclusive and whatnot, but where I see that aligned is not necessarily with mission statements. I see it aligned with what the school culture and climate is. And then also, of course, what the students are doing. Mm -hmm. And I say this because I, I feel very personally slighted, you know, whenever mission statements come up because I was working at a school back in South Carolina where I felt like not necessarily the mission statement changed year to year, but every year the principal had something new that they wanted to focus on. So one year it was growth mindset, but like not really because we, like she just said it and then we never talked about it, right? And then one year it was STEM, but not really because it was just said and then nobody talked about it. So for me as like a person in a unique space, as an instructional leader now, I really try to lead with intent and always back up what I say with my actions because I've been, and I'm sure y'all have at certain points too, right? In these spaces where people just say buzzwords and then they walk away. And then it's very frustrating because you can't do anything, right? Like you just said growth mindset. Well, what the heck am I supposed to do with that, <laughs> right? Like you said STEM, but you put a computer in my face and said, have fun, right? That's not STEM. So then what can we do to make it as cohesive as we can? And sometimes administrators don't have all the answers, but teachers do, right? Because we're the ones that are on the front lines working directly with students. So we have a lot of great ideas. Yeah. Well, I'd love to see some of your great ideas. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Perfect segue, Jeff. <laughs> all right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Give me two seconds. Um, okay. No, not that screen. This one. All right. So um, I've got a couple that are just based um, 
lots of different ways. So I'm going to move, I guess, from early childhood to, I don't know, no, 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 early childhood to elementary to high school and then to college. All right. So we're going to start uh, with STEM cooking. So something that some people know about me, if you follow me on social media, is that I used to teach and I still teach a STEM cooking class. Um, I'm a big baking and cooking fan. It is definitely the way that I really stress just personally in my home. But I also like the tangible practical applications that STEM brings to math and science. And I felt like that was really important. So when I worked at my independent school last year before I transitioned to this role, you know, they asked me if I wanted to do any after school clubs. And I said, are you sure? Right. Because STEM cooking, of course, involves a lot of mess. Right. It involves a lot of, you know, movement. I just don't think that they were ready for that, but they said yes to me anyway. So I took them up on that offer and I did a STEM cooking class. So what I did was um, I used Pear Deck, which is a platform that I'm very fond of. I love Pear Deck. I'm a Pear Deck super fan. Pear Deck is basically like an interactive PowerPoint where kids can draw and respond. And it's just a lot of fun. But we did a STEM cooking class on brownies. So this is with early childhood, I would say anywhere between. So this lesson in particular for the class, it was K through six, but I did this one with K through two. Okay. So my assistant was working with the older kids and I was really taking directive with the younger ones. So we did a little bit of just analysis, right? I'm asking for them to think, right? Cook keywords for today are sweet, chocolate, chewy. Draw what you're thinking that we're going to make today. And of course, you know, it's kids. They're kind of drawing all over the place, but we have a lot of fun. We get the energy out. And then what we do is we'll estimate, right? So we're drawing on those STEM principles, right? Estimating how much time do we think that it will take to bake our brownies today? Sometimes I got like a million minutes and I'm like, you know what? Like, cool, let's run with it. <laughs> what we did then was we did a concept map on understanding the recipe on steps right? So for what are we cooking in the middle? It was brownies. And then what I did was I outlined step by step. Of course, brownies take more than four steps, but I had to simplify it for K through two and looking at what it looked like over the course of our hour and a half that we had together, right? So step one might be mixed dry ingredients. Step two might be mixed wet ingredients. Step three might be add everything together. Step four might be put in the oven. Simplified, but enough where they could follow the process. And that was that procedural part of the scientific method that comes from STEM. So again, if we're talking about just clock time, right? K through two, I want them to tell time. <laughs> that is very important. Um, so I asked for them to label the clock for the current time. It was 3.30. We talked a little bit about correcting sentences, right? So. Uh, you know, to bake brownies, we do not need 10 cups of sugar, we need two, but that's looking at a sentence, right? That's going to be responsive to the ELA. Crossing out the word that's wrong and putting in the word that's right. We also do a little bit of what doesn't belong. Cayenne peppers do not belong in my brownies, unless I'm making some sort of um, special recipe is what I'll call it. Uh, orange juice also does not belong in my brownies. So we talk about what belongs, what doesn't, and why that works in the concept of STEM. Regular peppercorns also do not fit there. Um, but as we go through, you know, we do Venn diagrams, comparing, contrasting, right? So this is an applicable method to take a look at math and STEM and how it relates directly to our younger grades. If I were to go older, right? So if I were to do this with my older, like, like uh, grades three through six, that's when we get into fractions, right? So if I want to double my brownie recipe, triple it, do whatever to it, you know, there are a lot of opportunities there. Here, what I did with my youngers is just making sure that we understood the scientific method and the math behind cooking brownies. So that is example number one. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go to my second one. So I did this with like a um, upper middle school, early high school class. So if I were kind of to go back and think it would be like seventh to ninth grade. And this is something that we did with lines, angles and angle relationships in the community. I've also done this with elementary school. So if you've got like a high flying group of elementary school students where you think they can handle it, I highly recommend doing something like this. 
And to go back to my point in the original project where we talk about non-Eurocentric cultures and non-Eurocentric buildings and just non-Eurocentric things, right? These are conversations that can happen organically that are not necessarily part of your curriculum, but rather can be used as a resource. And I did this because the school that I worked at last year was an international school. So I would say, you know, um, now I'm, of course, I'm blanking on a building. I would say San Francisco Bridge, and they would have no clue what I was talking about, but they would know Taipei 101, right? They would know the Arc de Triomphe, right? They would know all of these different buildings that were across the world. So that was bred out of their cultural intellectual right knowledge, but then also built out of my wondering of what can we do to make this a little bit better? So as you know, in lots of different math classes, there are standards that specifically focus on angles and lines and line segments, right? All of those fun introductory parts of geometry. So what we did together was we did a project where I asked for them to pick a building or a landmark in the area. That was uh, nationally, internationally, right here in the Seattle Tacoma area that was of importance to them. Um, so I actually modeled this, if you can't tell from my background, I'm a big Disney fan, uh, but I modeled this off of Spaceship Earth in Epcot, but I encouraged them to choose whatever building they wanted. They did research on the building's history. They talked about the historical significance. They talked about the impact on the community and they wrote down the findings, right? Um, so I wanted them to do this to show that there's an intersectionality between culture and math that should not be ignored, right? The building is there and the math is there because there was a need, there was a cultural need for Sagrada Familia to be built, right? Then, what I wanted them to do, because this was also over break, and as you can tell from the due date, this was pre-COVID, uh, so a lot of my girls were still traveling, uh, but visit the building or do a digital exploration, right? So then comment on the types of angle relationships and lines and things that can be done during that time. Um, and then on top of that, I wanted for them to write down a summary as to how they arrived at how they got there. So that's what I call that math of cognition, right? We're thinking about math while we're doing our work and we're thinking about STEM. And then I also wanted for them to think about remodels. So if there was a remodel on the building, what kinds of new relationships can be formed? So this was a primarily math project, but this also leveraged uh, prospects of engineering. This also talked a little bit about science, right? The science of building. This also talked about technology, right? Because we're also leveraging and using technology to compile the findings into like a Word document or slides presentation. And what I had them do was present in front of everybody. I've never had students more excited to present <laughs> than for this project, but it's that passion element where they pick something that was interesting to them and they had never been able to do that before in math. So they were super excited and hyped for it. Uh, but this was a great project to do, of course, with that elementary, if your kids are ready, and then that middle to early high school. And that's again, culturally responsive coming to you live because this is a easy concrete way to bring this to students and also have it be a bit of a passion project for them. Moving right along, this is gonna be upper high school that I did. So this was gender and racial bias in mathematics. And gonna be honest, this was my favorite one. So um, I taught, uh, mini class of this um, at my last school. And again, my administrators were very kind and said, Victoria, you can teach whatever you want. I looked at them and said, are you sure? They looked at me and said, yes. And this was the product of the class. Um, so this was a class on gender and racial bias in mathematics. But even though I did this for high school, I've done this as low as elementary because I feel like the questions are broad enough where we can invite this type of conversation, but also talk about where uh, bias exists in STEM. So even though this specifically focuses on math right now, you will notice elements of STEM in the work that we do. We open up just by talking a little bit about why might bias exist in STEM. And I'm asking for my students to talk about different viewpoints, right? Their point of view versus another person's point of view. As you can see by the little pair in the bottom left, I'm again, Pear Deck, huge fan, highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already. Uh, but I did this through Pear Deck because they could draw all over the screens. 
So I wanted for them to anonymously display their responses so we can have a discussion because discussion is what it's all about. Then we go into some big questions together. So my big three, whenever I talk about bias in STEM, who is telling the story? Why is the story being told? How do we want the story to be remembered? And regardless of what you teach or how you teach it, I think that these are very important questions to ask. And going back to our prior conversation, right? I learned about George Washington Carver, Marie Curie and Florence Nightingale. That's it, right? Who was telling the story of my curriculum? Why was the story being told? And then how did people want the story to be remembered? So as educators, we really do have a very unique opportunity to break these questions and really invite other viewpoints or people or anything, right? To be a part of this. And I love the fact that we have the opportunity to do this in our classrooms. So these are my big questions I ask. Uh, because I was high school, I focused on Pythagorean theorem, you know, Pythagoras and his theorem, who told the story, why, how, right, the who, what, the why. But uh, what we also talk about is just what do we know about Pythagoras, right, and why do we know about them, right? We talk a little bit about the historical background and the context of the Pythagorean theorem, how it was not necessarily his theorem. It is just credited to him. And that is something that a lot of folks do not know. So we debunk it, we talk about it, right? We also talk about that myth of racial hierarchy and mathematical ability, how we have crazy theorems and people running around saying that aliens built the pyramids, right? There have been societies historically that have passed things down orally, meaning that they do not write them down. But because certain cultures worship the written word, right, and having a lab paper or having, you know, something on a document, that because it, it's not passed down traditionally, right, and that's part of that framework, that maybe people don't believe it. And that I feel dis completely discredits the folks that have come way before us that have done this work. Because I know I couldn't put together a pyramid, right? But I certainly could if I would have had the knowledge back then that had been passed down to me. It might not have been written down, but it's still just as valid and it should be recognized and honored. We also talk a little bit about that gender hierarchy and mathematical ability. Um, and I'm working on a course right now on social justice and math, coming to you soon, by the way. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we talk about is systemically women have been gate kept out of math and STEM fields. And that has been an issue. We can highlight things like hidden figures, but hidden figures, the movie, if you've ever seen it, it doesn't tell the whole story. You know, we can talk about Sally Carlson. Even that's not the whole story, right? We have to go straight to her as a source to figure out exactly what happened during her time in the field. So we hear things from the media, you know, we might hear things from external sources, but we figure out that, you know, the myth, again, it's just a myth. We know that women can do STEM. We know that people of color can do STEM, but we get the full picture when it comes directly from them as a source. So we debunk that myth and we talk about it a little bit together, because uh, as always, discussion is how we bring these topics to light. And then I always end with just a reflection for them. So I had them keep like a little math diary called a math memoir. Um, so we talk about what challenged them, you know, what inspired them. We talked about what sat well with their souls, what didn't sit well with them. And we talk about sharing out challenges, learning growth, you know, all that stuff. Um, but what I wanted them to do was really take this opportunity because not only did I teach at an independent school, but I taught in an all girls division. So a lot of my girls were wanting to pursue careers in science and math, but honestly didn't even know where to begin. This was a very reflective moment for them and very eye-opening to see what they could do to, of course, not only be a part of this, right, but also not change who they were. Because who they were, of course, is important, it's valued, it matters, and they shouldn't have to change who they are just to fit into a certain subset. And again, that's where we had a moment where Again, if you enter a space where you feel like you are not valued or that you are not being heard, you don't have to put up with that. So this, especially for my high school girls, this was the moment where I had the conversation with them about making sure that they understood that they don't have to put up with it if they don't want to. And when they don't want to, of course, means they go to college or they get a job, right? 
speaking of college and jobs, um, this is a snapshot of a course that I designed uh, for a college and it's called Probability and Statistics Through the Lens of Racial Justice. So again, this is going to be STEM focused specifically. Um, and this is infusing that culturally responsive with the STEM. So if I think about making sure that my students know how STEM relates to the real world, right? If we were to use that term, what we can do in this instance is align curriculum directly with what's going on in the world. And this was another moment where my director looked at me and said, you can do whatever you want. I said, are you sure? He said, yes. And this was one of the outcomes. Um, so what I did was I wanted to align the STEM specifically with province stat because probability and statistics happen in science. They happen in technology. They happen in math. It's not just like a math only issue. Uh, but what I wanted to do was focus this through the lens of racial justice. So speaking specifically about just modern topics that are going on in the world. And that's culturally responsive because that's culture, right? That is what is going on and that is happening right now. So if you take a look specifically, we've got a lot of these STEM you know, if you were to look at a stats course, you know, you'd have discrete distributions, you'd have continuous, you'd have estimation, you have tests of significance, but you'll also see some other things in here, right? Like exploring one variable data through racial equity, right? Exploring two variable data through racial equity, right? Misrepresenting data. So things that are kind of specific to this space right now. Course skills, course content, pretty common. But what I did for my texts was I've got like a regular stats book, but I've also got some additional readings and resources that highlight the culturally responsive. Um, and this specifically talks just about understanding and interpreting statistics and basically how statistics influence our world at large, regardless of where somebody falls, right? You could be an English teacher and you can still recognize how algorithms impact us. So uh, like that was very intentional on my part to make sure that that was a thing. And then for scope and sequence, I mean, you'll notice that the questions are very STEM focused, but you'll notice that they also have an undercurrent of racial justice. So this can be done. And I bring this up to say that this is a topic and this is a practice that if you really put your mind to it, it can be done. And when I think culturally responsive, I think this. I mean, I think all of what I shared, but I definitely think this because we're making it applicable to what's going on in the world for our students right now. And if you struggle, right, if you're in STEM and if you struggle, there are a lot of natural connections that can be made between STEM and what's going on in the world. It might take a little bit of creativity, but the connections are certainly there. So with that being said, I went through early childhood, elementary, middle, high school and college. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I will leave it up to um, additional questions and discussion. While we're waiting for some questions to come through, I mean, I don't mean to oversimplify what you've gone through, but you know, I'm comparing the world of STEM as you've described it and reflecting, I also grew up in New Jersey and reflecting on my own elementary, middle, high school, university experience. And I think you're basically saying, let's make it be about reality. And, right. you know, that sounds simple, but I'm thinking back to, again, the way that I learned math and it had nothing to do with reality. Yeah, you know, so it really, it was do chapter three, the odd problems. Right. Even when Especially I talk to teachers and we talk about things like money, Right, like especially with early childhood and elementary, money is usually used as a vehicle for learning math, right? Like Victoria has 10 dimes, right? Like Ren's got like five nickels, <laughs> like, right? He, he's, been, he's been pretty good tonight, I'm pretty proud of him. Uh, but like, so like, what's the total, right? That's not applicable. Like I can have 10 dimes. It would be very odd for my dog to have five nickels. Yeah. You know, we can have a problem like that, but why not use that as a vehicle for actual problem solving? Yeah. You know, like maybe a budget, maybe an allowance, you know, like m maybe something that actually makes sense instead of throwing arbitrary amounts of money out there. You know, I think of like the math problem where it's like, well, they have 60 watermelons and I'm like, why would somebody have 60 watermelons? That doesn't make sense. Right. And <laughs> yeah. even, you know, uh, you know, having real world problems 
and the confidence that gives learners in terms of, I have had experience thinking about actual problems, not problems just steeped in fantasy. You know, you don't necessarily feel like you've had any problem solving rehearsal then. So, you know, again, it sounds, it sounds so obvious, but what you're describing, you know, it, I think for many of us, or I'm showing my age here, that is not that is not the world of, of math or science or engineering that we- When you just, yeah. And you think today in today's world, like, I mean, just use the pandemic. I mean, how many statistics are we bombarded with on a daily basis? Right. You know, that you're trying to make sense of numbers that are constantly coming at you <laughs> from multiple different sources. And how are you receiving those numbers? How are you, do you understand what those numbers represent? Uh, a percentage of what, a statistic of what? Uh, you know, and I just think, you know, to your, to your point, there are so many real world, pro a, a, there are so many real world applications that we have sitting around us. Number one, number two, to your point, Trisha, I think when you and I were in school, we probably didn't have a lot of access to them outside of our school. Like there was no computer when I went to school. That's how old I am. Right. Like th so now wasn't. I have to ask, now I have to ask, cause we're all saying the same things, but I'm pretty sure we're all different ages. So Jeff, how old are you? I'm 44. Okay. I'm 40. I'm 27. Wow. I'm 27. So yeah. So literally I graduated from high school a decade ago and I still yeah. did not get any of this. I, yeah. I did not get any of this. Well, and you just think about what does this do to our opportunities? I mean, after, for better or for worse, after the pandemic, every kid's got a laptop. I mean, every kid has, is going to know how to hopefully access this or we as teachers at least do, you know? And so how are we using that? What, what does that look like when we invite, you know, the Wi-Fi into our classroom and we have kids who are looking at real world statistics or looking at real world budgets. Right. I did a budgeting thing the other day with a science, with a career and a CTE course around life, life skills. And it was around this idea of creating a budget and you can just go to websites that will automatically tell you, you put in your gross income, you give it whatever zip code you live at, and it'll tell you what your net income is. Like the stuff's out there and you right. can use real, real data. Like go to indeed.com, look up the job you want to have. There's how much you're going to make. Right. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. I mean, why are we having kids <laughs> make up, pretend you have a hundred thousand dollars? No, pretend you have $59,764. Cause that's really what you're going to make. <laughs> right. And the kids know it too. And the kids you know, know there it. have been so many conversations I've had with teachers around like secure assessment. Right. And they're like, Oh, well, how am I supposed to take a test? I was like, well, you can't right? like, yeah, you can't. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> like, I'm really sorry, but, yeah. but, but assessment is not going to look different. Yeah. Right. So the question needs to revolve around then how are you changing assessment? Absolutely. So that way it can't just be something that your kid can Google or, you know, text a friend or whatever. Right. Because I feel like sometimes we, we have gotten so complacent with the state of our education where we felt like we haven't needed to innovate because of the situations we've been in before. Then the pandemic hit. And I was at a school where they were asking us to think about this because remember we were an international school and, I, and I'm in Seattle. So this is where like the first outbreak happened, right? Yeah, so yeah. when it happened, everyone's losing their minds rightfully. We get communication from our director that essentially says, we might not be in school. So figure out what it would look like. That was in January, right? Yeah. Just kind of a one-off email. Can you sit, sir? You're not part of this webinar. <laughs> then in February, we received communication that, uh, you know, this might be a possibility again, right? So it became from a one-off to something a little bit more serious. And again, we were prepared. That was us having like a smooth month and a half of preparing. Some of the schools around me found out day of that they were being shut down. It was hard to innovate then because yeah. I completely understand the stress, but I mean, I'm in a district where we're 100% virtual and I'm constantly, I feel like meeting with teachers for very good reasons because we're figuring out how to innovate assessment and that's how yeah. it should be, right? We yeah. shouldn't be trying to replicate everything that was face-to-face -face in a virtual environment. We should be figuring out what worked there, what works here, and then also finding other ways to innovate too. Mm -hmm. What district are you working in now? So I'm in Federal Way Public Schools. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so yeah that is Seattle-ish. Seattle-ish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, though, and unfortunate that it sometimes has to be the crisis that pushes for innovation. And, you know, just I, I wanted to go back and, you know, with the time that we have left, because you had mentioned the idea of 
algorithms, questioning research, you know, and I kind of feel like I see that as a, I mean, it's, it's a, already a little bit of a crisis, this, just the prevalence of fake news. And I think it's going to get to a tipping yeah. point where yeah. I know some yeah. schools are doing a great job around that, that news literacy piece, but I still find it's not, I don't think as much at the forefront as it needs to be. Um, yeah. And I really love that you brought up that idea of, you know, algorithms are not neutral, right? They're not neutral and understanding that. Cause I, I do hear sometimes people say, oh, you know, it's all right, like the algorithm will do it as though it's, you know, this completely bias free model. And it's not, you know, one of the, the best books that I read in 2020, it's unfortunately only an audio book. So audible users, um, it's sex, race and robots, and it kind of goes into uh, in, in depth. So I actually I've got the link, I'll drop that in the chat if anybody else is curious about it incredible, incredible book. Wow. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering what other conversations you're having at your school around that, because I think there there's still a, a broader conversation to be had around this idea of just understanding, you know, algorithms have been designed by humans. They're not, you know, just sort of this cosmic force that, you know, again, is neutral. Right. So I haven't had many conversations yet. Um, and honestly, I think that this was just the nature of the first semester of the school year. So for disclosure, our first day of school got completely canceled because of wildfires that were in the Western area yep. of the United States. So that was a wash. And of course we're remote um, tech hurdles that we had to encounter right with kids. And then my school is a PBL school as well. So we do like a big showcase for students and such uh, which is a lot of fun and that was today but there was a lot of focus just on like what does normal look like in a virtual learning environment so my discussions about things like this have been very surface level just kind of mentioning hey let's not unintentionally right like harm our learners you know here are some tried and true resources that you can use that are good for this type of thing uh, but what i'm planning on doing once we get into second semester is really dive deep into this kind of stuff because when we had, uh, you know, just kind of trial runs and things like that, you know, there are certain websites that come up that students are using, you know, and there are certain websites that will show images first, right? And what do those images look like, right? What do those websites have in common? And that's something that I don't think that we consciously, right, will realize and recognize. But after doing a little bit of digging and deeping, you know, you will understand like, oh my gosh, like the same three websites really show up the entire time. And that's problematic because if we're also thinking for our students to be critical researchers and critical thinkers, that's not just going to the first page of Google. Yeah. And I run into that all the time with kids, right? Like they go to the first page and that's it. Or at the last school that I worked at when I was in South Carolina, because of the filters that the school had on the internet, right? They could only show certain things. So my kids were only kind of taking from like, you know what, how sometimes Google will like extract a yeah. blurb? Yeah. yeah. They were only taking from that blurb and that's where they would stop. Oh, that yeah. is where their research would start and stop. And that's when I had to step in and say no. Right. Here's how you can be a critical thinker within the confines of this weird school internet. Um, but when I work with my teachers and my students next semester, that's definitely a point that I'm going to think about. Oh, you've just totally inspired me. Like now I'm even thinking of a project, like let's, if we only looked at the first page of results, you know, and just kind of taking a few different questions, like if we never go beyond that, uh, that even just that I think would be such a cool project. Thanks. Mm -hmm. that you so, just kind of inspired that. Well, that just makes, I mean, that makes me think we have the free PDF that is teaching students how to read a search result page. And there's actual lesson plans in there from kindergarten through 12th grade, because I don't think we take that time to do that. And how do you teach kids to get outside of the search bubble? You know, that we are all confined into a search bubble for better, or for worse. And I'm not saying that it's good, but there's a reason why we keep going back to the same search engines because it works. Um, you know, and so how do you get kids to think outside of that bubble? A, do you know yeah. that you're in a bubble and B, how do you break it? And so, the thing I love is like, it takes, it's, it's knowing one little hack to break the, the bubble. Like, you know, one little hack and you break the bubble. Not only do you break the bubble, you start to, you know, focus on a specific point of view. Every time I'm having kids research on the internet, I ask kids, what is, whose point of view do you want to get material from? Yeah. And then you can look specifically at that point of view. If you know how to use the system, use the system against itself. Um, but we're not, we're not teaching that, you know? 
Yeah. So a project that I do or, or that I did with kids was I would give them like a random Wikipedia article or something, or maybe like a random article. And I would try to get them to see how many clicks it would take them to get back to like the main mathematics page. <laughs> And they were very confused. Right? Like, like I'd give them like Dolly Parton, right? <laughs> or, or, or I'd give them like Walt Disney and they'd be very confused as to how they would even end up there. But, you know, that project was twofold to show that math and a lot of things are very closely connected and they're interwoven, yep. uh, but also just to be a critical thinker and researcher when it comes to these types of resources. Because if you were not paying attention, you would just look at the Dolly Parton page and be like, Mrs. Thompson, this is ridiculous. I'm not doing this. Yeah. But, you know, with clever thinking and reworking, you're able to get from Dolly Parton to math. Yeah. Yeah. I That's love great. that. Yeah. And you, uh, uh, STEMicists, am I, am I saying STEMicists. that? STEMicists. STEMicists. I, I love that. And just, you know, I, I think a lot of the examples that you walked us through really, you know, it does sort of amplify that mindset of, see the math, see the science around you. And, you know, again, it's, of course it is there, but are we reminding students of that? that or there, yeah. are we telling them the story that like, you know, math is just this abstract thing that lives only in a textbook. Right. And one of the things I really push for in my work, especially now as a coach, is making sure that folks know that STEM really, STEM is not just formulas and numbers and values and a lab report. Right, STEM is all around us. And it's about looking at the world and thinking critically about the things that we see around us and figuring out how they work and why they work that way. So once we move from this, you know, STEM is a formula, STEM is this, STEM is that. And once we get into the practical and the applicable, then students really you know, view it as part of their own. But part of the challenge is getting from here to here. And then once we get to the point where we need to be, that's when we start having a lot of fun. Yeah. And that solves your engagement issue. You know, I, right, I think, exactly. you know, so often teachers say, oh, you know, students aren't engaged in this. And I think unless it does have that relevance, you know, that that's a massive hurdle. If it doesn't feel relevant, if it doesn't feel like the world they live in. Absolutely. Yeah. You know. it, it, it has to be relevant. Right. And it also has to be responsive. And that's what culturally responsive STEM is all about. Right. Like because culture just doesn't mean your personal identity or, and how you identify. It also means the culture of the class. Right. So if I'm working with the classroom and if they want to learn more about prison reform, well, then you best believe I'm going to be talking about prison reform in my stats unit. Right. Because that is an applicable way yeah. to talk about statistics and how it relates to the different areas you know, especially here in Washington, right? right. Um, you know, like if I have a class that is really interested in just, you know, misogyny and how that might play into different roles, different jobs, you know, like pay increases, pay decreases, then I will talk about that when we talk about exponential growth, right? Like, let's talk about wages, let's talk about jobs. There are so many ways to put this in that don't necessarily have to always relate to race and identity and gender and, and mm. binaries and all these things. It can literally be the culture of your classroom. You know, if you've got a class that wants so desperately to learn about, you know, Supreme Court and how all that works, then you can totally use that as a vehicle for some of your lessons and activities in your classroom. Yep, and that's true inquiry. You know, you were mentioning earlier this idea of sometimes schools have buzzwords, but there's no substance beneath them. And I think, you know, that that's it, right? Can the learning go where the learners would like it to go? And it is, you know, again, being open and honest about that question. How many learners on your campus or in your virtual learning environment feel like they've had that autonomy to take the learning to the place where they're interested? I would love, I'd love to do more research around that and see, how has that shifted? Because, you know, we were talking a lot about our own educational experiences. I certainly never would have even thought to have said, I would like to learn about. Oh, no way. And I'm 27. I would have <laughs> never looked a teacher in the eye and said, you know what sounds great? Prison reform. <laughs> like my, my teacher would have looked at me and I'm friends with a lot of my teachers. Like we've reconnected on social media, but I would have never thought to ask them that. And even looking on, you know, some of the stuff that they're doing now, I don't think that they would also want for kids to ask them that as well, right? Because I feel like sometimes as teachers, we're given curriculum, right? This is what we teach, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, again, curriculum walks alongside the culturally responsive. They do not need to operate in a vacuum. 
So it might require a little bit of creativity and, you know, clever footwork, but we eventually get to where we need to be. And that's, what's most important because we're doing it for the kids. Yeah. Doing it for the kids. I love that. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, It's always great to have somebody here in the state uh, doing this work with us. So I always appreciate it. Appreciate you spending your, uh, I don't even know what today is, Tuesday? Tuesday it's, evening with us. <laughs> apparently Tuesday. I apparently woke up Tuesday. I, I thought it was Thursday. Uh, I said it's Friday and she's like, it's not. Friday. I know. It's just not. <laughs> I, had to, I was like, oh my gosh, it's got to be the end of the week already, right? No, it's Tuesday. So it's good. But uh, thank you for spending time with us. Really appreciate it. Uh, great stuff. You can find more. Uh, if you want to follow Victoria, you uh, have her Twitter account there at Victoria the Tech. Uh, behind me and uh, also her website. And we'll make sure all of that stuff is on uh, the Shifting Schools website and in the podcast as well. Victoria, thank you so much. Yes, uh, really appreciate you spending your your time and in, 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 uh, information and knowledge with us this evening. Yes, thanks for also inviting. I mean, he wasn't invited, he just showed up, but I feel like he was a pretty good guest. <laughs> He's amazing. I, I'm gonna show you this tonight. It's my Wednesday. See, see that's, that's how a dog does dog. That's what you need. <laughs> not biting not yeah. peeing and chewing on everything look yeah amazing and i'm going to be i'm still going to be thinking about that venn diagram you know the the yeah. cake and brownies the differences and the similarities like that's a conversation i feel like even at 40 that i can that i can have at depth so thank you for that that venn diagram you know what's interesting about that 